The first section, Unit 3, has a lot of definitions in it, so this is actually going to be pretty long. And there's almost no math. And, I mean, realistically, statistics does have a mathematical underpinning, but it's a significantly different perspective because when you're dealing with just pure math, then you're dealing in absolutes, right? Where there's one right answer and everything else is wrong, right? How many possible subsets are there of the given set, right? There's one right answer to that. Uh, but then with statistics, um, a lot of it is about uncertainty, right? If you're trying to estimate a population mean and you're going to get a confidence interval to do it, right? That's a fairly common statistical procedure. But the interval that you end up with is based on your sample data and your sample, I mean, like if you took a bunch of different samples, they're all going to be different, right? So then you say, well, is there really one right answer in that case? That's a very difficult argument to make. So um, it is kind of a different perspective when you're talking about statistics. And the biggest thing generally that you would do is this first thing. Um, just the idea of statistical inference, that generally what you do is that you want to get an idea about some aspect of a population. And maybe the population's too big to where you couldn't get a hold of every individual and get the appropriate measurement. Um, just to pick an easy one, let's say your population is all adults in the U.S. Right? There are way too many of those to realistically be collecting data from every single one. Um, you know, if it's an opinion poll or something, like that's just out of touch with reality. So what do you do instead? Well, what you do instead is that you take a sample of US adults and then you collect data from your sample and you try to use that to say something about the population. And there are things that you have to do to get that to work right. I mean, you can't have your sample be really tiny. You couldn't have a sample of like eight people and expect that to really get anywhere. But also you want your sample to represent the population pretty well. Because if somehow your sample represents the population badly, then your conclusions probably aren't gonna be very good. Right? There are things like that that have to get factored in. But the general idea is that what you do with statistical inference is you take sample data to try to say something about a population. So what's the difference between a population and a sample? First of all, basically the sample is a little piece of the population. So the population is usually some big group, but it's the group that you're actually interested in, right? Like maybe it is all U.S. adults. And then your sample, you go, well, all U.S. adults is a lot of people. You know, we're not going to really be able to pull that off to get information from everybody. So maybe our sample is a thousand U.S. adults. Right? And then from your sample, you actually collect the data, whatever it is that you're, um, that you're concerned with. So really, when it comes down to it, is the sample is a tiny little subset of the population, but it's the one that you actually collect data from. So in this example, that's kind of what this is about. So um, it says that a USA Today CNN Gallup survey, 369 working parents, found 200 of the 369 who said they spend too little time with their children because of work commitments. So what's the sample? Well, it's the individuals from which data is actually collected. So here it's this, right? That's whose opinions they actually got, those 369 working parents that were surveyed. So that's what we can put for the sample here. So just the 369 working parents who were surveyed. And I think that's about as specific as you can make that. I mean, you can think, well, I mean, USA Today, CNN, Gallup, those are all things in the United States. So, I mean, if you wanted to say the 369 uh, working parents in the US who were surveyed, that's probably correct. But since it doesn't explicitly say that, I'm just going to say, okay, the sample is a bunch of working parents, period. We're just going to leave it like that. But then what's the population? Well, um, the population should be a larger group of the same type of individuals. So here, if the sample is 369 working parents, so the individuals are working parents, the individuals in the population should also be working parents, except the whole group. 
So I think the best that we could do here is probably just to say all working parents. Right, so that's what we're trying to get an estimate of, or an, that's the group we're trying to get an estimate about um, from our sample or based on our sample would be all working parents. Um, and then what would be the data collected from each individual? Well, basically it's just, in, in the way that this is phrased, it looks like they were just asked a question. Do you feel like you spend too little time with your children because of work commitments? So I would think what you'd be getting would be a yes or a no. Um, Right, so I would say a yes or a no, right? It's just gonna be like a reply, a kind of a brief one. Um, depending on if a working parent, I was about to write a parent, but I should, I should be rigorous. A working parent thought they spend uh, too little time with their children, and I'm just gonna put an ellipsis here because this is already getting pretty long, but because of work commitments is the rest of it, right? Um, the other thing I wanna point out is it's probably not just a yes or a no. I mean, it might be, but if you wanna get into like what would be good experimental design, um, in addition to those definitive answers, you're also supposed to give people an out. So I'm gonna put this in another color. Um, so I would say, or maybe, right? Because that would give people an out if they couldn't give a definitive answer. Um, and really, you got to have those in there to have a, a decent design of the survey. Um, so maybe or an I don't know, um, but those effectively cover the same ground. Um, but that's what you get, right? Like what the data would look like after it was collected would be a bunch of yeses, nos, and maybes, right? Um, it's probably sitting in like an Excel file or a CSV or something. Okay, um, and that's fine. Um, if you have data that aren't numbers, you can still do things. You can still figure out proportions, which is basically what's going on if I scroll back up. Like that's what you would do with this because you would say you've got the 200, you got the 369. And so then from there, the sample proportion would be 200 over 369, right? So then there's your summarized sample data right there, right? Um, because that's the thing that's gonna be easier to understand than just like this long string of yes, no's, and maybe's, right? Um, but anyway, going on to the, the next thing. So, you know, we have this difference between the population and the sample, and you say, okay, fine, the sample is a subset of the population from which you actually collect information. But what's this called, right? You get some number from the sample, um, right? Some kind of summarized value. Um, and that's ultimately the thing that you're after. That is the thing that's actually called a statistic. Like it says right here, statistic is a number computed from data in the sample. Um, and it's used to estimate a parameter, which would be sort of the analogous measurement from the population. So like if you had a sample proportion um, of you know, parents who thought they didn't spend enough time with their kids, then you can use that to estimate the proportion of um, working parents in the population who don't think they spend enough time with their kids. That sort of thing, where you would use it to estimate the analogous population measure. So the statistics and parameters, they can be proportions, they can be means, um, they can be other things too, but it's usually one of those. Um, so the weird thing here is, so these are both by definition numbers, right? Like it says, it's a number, it's a number, right? The statistic is gonna come out as a number because you'll have the sample data and you can actually compute it. The parameter tends not to, because unless you have a census, 
And the thing that, that we call the census kind of colloquially, I guess, um, the U.S. census, um, that is a specific kind of census. I guess that's like the capital C census, where the little c census is one where the sample is equal to the population. All right, so like in a general sense, that's what a census is. And the census is right the one every 10 years that collects demographic data. Um, but generally, you don't have that. Right, generally your sample is a little tiny piece of the population. Look at that last example. The sample size was 369. There are way, way more adults in the U.S. than that. Uh, right, you can add a few zeros <laughs> at the end of that number. Um, but um, the idea here that I'm trying to get at is, yes, by definition the parameter is a number, but you probably wouldn't be able to express it like that. That's a thing that kind of feels weird. And we'll see it when we get down um, into these parameter-based examples. That because you have the sample data, you can actually compute the statistic, but typically you can't compute the parameter. So if you have to say what it is, usually that means you gotta write it out in words, even though it's a number. Um, the reason I got the P in bold and underlined there, and the same thing with the S, is this is the way that everybody keeps these straight that the parameter goes to the population, statistic goes to the sample, they start with the same letters. Right? That's all that that's supposed to signify there. Um, but then suppose we have a study concerned with the average age of people who live in Arizona, just to give sort of a differentiation of like, this is what a parameter looks like, and this is what a statistic looks like that are about the same topic. So let's say the thing that we wanted to estimate was the average age of all people in Arizona, but you know, it wasn't like a year that ends in a zero and, you know, we didn't have the money to like try to pull off the census or the manpower or whatever else. So instead, what we're going to have to do is use a sample and then try to estimate from there. So let's say if we had a random sample of 500 people in Arizona, the average age that we get um, from averaging those 500 ages in our sample, that would be the statistic, right? So it's the one that relates to the sample. Right, so statistic, sample. Um, and then the parameter would relate to the population, which here the population is this, right? That right there is the population. Well, I guess really it's this whole thing, right? So maybe I should just, um, instead of having that circle, I should just have it be this, right? That's a little more accurate. Right? The all is the key word, right? That universal quantifier that's saying that it's everybody. Um, but usually what will happen is to write out what the parameter is, they look like this, where they're just in words. And then the statistic, usually you can end up writing that as a number. Here we don't have sample data um, exactly, so we can't do it. But generally, that's what you end up with. All right, so then to go through and identify some examples as parameters or statistics. So first one, a recent survey of 35 college career centers reported that the average starting salary for petroleum engineering majors is 83,121, right? So we, we've got our number right here. So the 83,121, is that gonna be a parameter or a statistic? Well, the thing you have to check is what group does that relate to? It relates to this. There are more than 35 college career centers in the U.S., right? So you can look at that and go, okay, that's that number's too small. That's got to be a sample. I would agree. That's a reasonable way to do it. The other word that's kind of a big red flag is survey. Um, usually when you see survey, that goes along with a sample, but the big thing is the 35. Right? So you look at this, you go, this looks like it's a sample. That's not all of the college career centers for sure, right? So um, therefore, it must be a statistic, right? Because 35 college career centers is a sample. All right, what about this next one? Um, we got the 2,182 students who accepted admissions offers to Northwestern in 2009, average SAT score 1442. So that 1442, is that gonna be a population mean or is that a sample mean? Well, this right here, I guess this is kind of long. 
there. Um, that's everybody, right? Like this is the entire group of people who accepted admission to Northwestern. So this is actually a population. So then that means that the 1442, that's a parameter. So I guess I could put the, the numbers in here too. The 83, 121 is a statistic and 1442 is a parameter because it's relating to a population up here. Um, then number six, um, this one might actually be easier because that 32% that use an electric toothbrush, that's coming from 300 adults in the U.S. And if you're thinking, well, there are way more than that, that's the right idea, right? There's no way. This is the whole population, right? So this right here, the 300 adults in the U.S., that's got to be a sample. So that means that the 32% is a statistic, right? Got to be. All right. So parameter goes with population, uh, statistic goes with sample. So basically we just had to look at those groups and figure out what they were, right? Is this a population or is it a sample? And once we have that, we we're pretty much good to go with figuring out what kind of measure we had. All right, next thing, and you can kind of see this here, that sometimes you would have quantitative data and sometimes you wouldn't. Because um, I guess with the not spending enough time with your kids, that's not quantitative data, right? The individual values are yes, no's, and maybes. But then here you go, well, this is money, right? Like individual salaries are going to be numbers. Um, individual SAT scores are numbers. But here, this is a yes or a no. Or I guess maybe sometimes. But I guess that would be the one that gives people an out. Um, but then the types of data. So sometimes you have numbers, sometimes you don't. So qualitative is not numbers and then quantitative is numbers so qualitative data um, since that's a term that um, the newton notes use um, i usually call that categorical data although um, different books kind of flip-flop between the two terms um, but it's basically things that aren't numbers so names and labels things like place of birth eye color college major right those aren't numbers right if you wrote out what they were you'd be writing out a word or an abbreviation. Um, or I guess with college major, that can be more than one word, but you get the idea, not numbers. Quantitative data, numbers, right? Which makes sense. You think quantitative, that's what that means. Um, so numbers representing counts or measurements, um, right? So like um, essentially the monetary amounts, um, you could view those as being counts. It's the number of dollars that you would accumulate as an engineer, right? Um, but things like age, height, temperature, right? Those are all things that you express as numbers, um, right? And I guess height, you kind of um, use like a hybrid thing where you have um, two different but related units typically um, combined together, but still that's a number, right? Um, so telling the difference between these usually isn't too bad, right? It's either, do you have numbers or do you not have numbers? All right. More examples. Um, these are a little more thorough because it's got here population sample parameter and statistics. So it's kind of a lot of stuff. All right. So I think it'll all fit in here though, because none of these individually take a lot of writing. So let's see. A shipment of ball bearings is to be inspected by a customer. And the customer wants the average diameter to be within 0 0.02 centimeters or two and a half centimeters. Otherwise, they're going to send the, sh the uh, shipment back and they're going to say, this, this isn't what I wanted. This isn't good enough. And the customer inspects 100 ball bearings in the shipment, which have an average diameter of 2.485 centimeters. Okay, looks like the, this sample mean here is working out, right? That's within 0 0.02. Um, so what we're going to figure out is what the population sample parameter and statistic are. Um, it's easier to do the sample measures first, I think. So I'm actually going to go sample population statistic parameter. So first for the sample. Um, well, it's the, and, and notice that here the individuals aren't humans. They don't have to be, right? Here the individuals are ball bearings. 
right? Those are the individuals that information is being collected from, even though really the only information is how wide they are, right? It's their diameter. But um, the group that actually have the diameter measured are just these hundred, right? So what we, would, we, what we could say for the sample would be maybe the 100 ball bearings inspected, right? Because those are the individuals that are having their diameters measured, right? It's just those 100, it's not the whole shipment. The whole shipment, however, that's our population. So the population, I think the easiest way to say it would just be all ball bearings in the shipment, then the statistic We do have a number for this, right? Because it's right here. That 2.485, that comes out of, it comes from the sample of 100. So 2.485 centimeters, or you could write this in words if you wanted as the average, I'm gonna abbreviate average just to make sure I can fit all this in. So the average diameter of the 100 ball bearings inspected. And then the parameter, it would be the analogous measurement, but for the whole population. So um, it, this thing that I've got in parentheses, we can actually kind of base it off of that. So it's still gonna be the average diameter. And I guess to take it a little farther, you could say it's still gonna be the average diameter of ball bearings, just not only these 100, but all of them in the shipment. So the average diameter of, and then you can basically just use the wording of the population there, which is what I'm gonna do. So all ball bearings. in the shipment. And notice there's no way to write the parameter as a number, right? You can explain it in words, like what kind of number it is, right? Like what it relates to um, and you know what it's actually measuring, but you still have to write it in words. Whereas with the statistic, we get a number because the customer would have recorded those 100 diameters. So they could just add them up and divide by 100, right? And they can actually do the computation there. Um, and that's usually the way it goes. Usually you can actually write the statistic as a number, but you can't do it with the parameter. And you just have to write the parameter out in words where it's like you want the type of number, um, what it's measuring, and then what your population is. And those things are all in there. Okay, next. Um, a Bloomberg Business Week subscriber study collected data from a sample of 2,861 subscribers. Average annual income of the respondents was $84,000 and 49% reported having an American Express card. Okay, first things first, the sample. Um, the thing that I guess would be the trap is to just have the sample size, the 2861. And that's, I mean, that's a thing that you want, but you need to be a little more specific than that. So for the sample, I, I want the 2861, but I want to also say what kind of individuals we have. So I'm going to say the 2,861 Bloomberg Business Week subscribers surveyed. Um, and then, all right, well, then what would the population be? Well, if the sample is made up of individual Bloomberg Business Week subscribers, it would make sense that the population should be all of them instead of just a little group. So the population is all 
Bloomberg Business Week subscribers. Okay, and then there are a couple of variables being measured. So we want to identify both of them and classify each one as um, qualitative or quantitative. So for each person, two things are being recorded, right? Because we have these two sample measures, right? The average annual income of 84,000, right? That's a statistic. And then the 49% having the American Express card, that's also a statistic. So for each individual, you don't um, measure their average annual income, you just average their annual income. Right, it says average there because it's averaging the 2861 in the sample, right? Um, so one of them would be annual income, which is a thing that you would write as a number. So that's one that should be quantitative. And then the other one would be, um, I guess, if a subscriber had an American Express card or not or whether or not a subscriber has an American Express card. So let's say whether or not a subscriber has an American Express card. And that is not a number, right? Because that's a yes or a no. So that one would be qualitative or if you want to use the word that I use categorical um, all right so then for one of those variables we want to identify the parameter and the statistic I actually think there's enough room here to do both so for annual income it let's see it said um, that the average annual income from the sample was 84,000. That'll be our statistic. But the parameter, if you're going to write that out in words. So if I go up for a second. So the average annual income from the sample is 84,000. So then the parameter would be the average annual income from the population. So the average or mean um, I guess I'll just say average for now. So average annual income of all Bloomberg Business Week subscribers. And then the statistic is 84,000. If you wanted to write that in words as the average annual income of the 2,861 Bloomberg Business Week subscribers who were surveyed, you could, but it's a lot shorter just to write the number. Um, and then the other one um, about the Amex card. Let's see. So there the parameter. Um, I guess we've been phrasing things with percents a little bit, but it's probably better to use a proportion. So I'm going to say either the proportion or percentage of all Bloomberg Business Week subscribers who have an American Express card. And then the statistic, if you're going to, if you're going to phrase it as a proportion, I guess you would say 0.49 or as a percentage, 49%, right? That's what it says up above. So um, either way, but I guess like if you were actually going to go through and grind out some of the computations, you'd want to do the conversion into writing it as a proportion. Okay, um, so a lot of writing on that page. Very little on the next couple, but there's a ton of text. Um, so with the sampling methods, it was easier for me just to write it all out and then to kind of put in little examples to differentiate them from each other. So a simple random sample, 
Um, it's sort of like the idea of pulling names out of a hat, but more rigorous, um, where the definition is that um, like if n is your sample size, which usually that's what that means in statistics if you have an n, that's what that's referring to. Um, but you would pick your sample in such a way that every sample of that size would have the same chance of being chosen. Most people think about that as meaning that every individual would have the same chance of being chosen. Um, technically, that statement is a consequence of this one, but if you want to think about it that way, that will be totally fine. Um, but then how do you do it? Um, so you got a company with 10,000 employees and they want to um, take a simple random sample of 300 of them. Well, then they could label everybody use a random number generator to get 300 labels that are randomly selected. And then um, those 300 labels, each one corresponds to an employee. So then those are the employees that end up in the sample, right? Like if, I don't know, label 4,157 is in there, you go, okay, what person corresponds to that number? Okay, it's that employee, now they're in the sample, right? And I guess you would do that 300 times, although really you would make software do it, not do it by hand yourself. Um, so that's the easiest one, where it's kind of like uh, pulling names out of a hat. Um, a stratified sample is kind of like a bunch of simple random samples, except that first what you do is you take your population and you break it up into subgroups or strata, which is where the word stratified comes from. Um, and then you would take a simple random sample from each subgroup. Um, the Newton notes add in that um, they need to be proportionate, but that's not always true. Um, I guess when you're doing the homework, it would behoove you to think of it like that, but um, in the grand scheme of things, um, that's a little bit more strict than what really has to happen. Um, so they can be determined based on all kinds of different things, um, like by ages, which like for a lot of TV viewership, that's how it's done, right? Because you got the like the 18 to 34 demographic and the 35 to 49 demographic. Right, so you got those subgroups in there. Um, geographic location, maybe different states or different regions of the country or something. Um, different occupations. Um, I guess you could um, do it by gender, but um, that one you don't really get as I think as much of a feel for like having a, a whole bunch of of different ones. Um, so you you could though if you wanted to, I and mean, there's nothing wrong with that. That would that would give you different subgroups. Um, so a lot of times it's location based. Um, that's probably the most common one if I had to guess. Um, and that's why I kind of set up this example of where it was location based, where it says an advertising firm interested in determining how much to emphasize TV advertising in a certain county. Um, they're going to conduct a sample survey to estimate the average number of hours each week that households um, watch television, but they think there might be some differences. So let's say if the county has two towns. Um, so I guess like the Arizona counties are kind of a bad analog here because they're so big, right? They've all got more than a couple of towns um, for sure. Um, maybe like, well, I used to live in Kentucky. They have 120 counties there. So there are some of those that have two towns. Um, so uh, some of them have one actually. Um, but let's just say two towns, A and B, and then a rural area, C. Um, and then the towns are different, right? One has a factory, um, and most households contain factory workers of school-aged children. The other town has mostly retirees, and then in the rural area, you mostly have farmers. So you think, okay, these are three different groups of people, so maybe their TV watching habits are going to be different. So there, maybe it would help to have that comparison where then you say, okay, well, if there's a way where, um, you know, this part of the county is getting um, a little bit of extra advertising, we're going to push a little more money this way rather than this part because we don't think that this part's going to be quite as interested in the product um, just because of, you know, demographically, like, like what if the thing is like some, you know, high-end farm implement? Like um, the people in the rural area might want to see that, right? Like that might be something they'd be interested in. But um, the people working in the factory probably don't need it. So, right, that's where I, I think it would make sense to have that comparison in there. But the idea with the stratified sample, since that's supposed to be the point of this, is that you take the whole county and here it's being broken into three subgroups, 
right? So town A, town B, rural area C, and there's a simple random sample being taken from each subgroup. So that's the stratified sample idea. Um, a cluster sample, this is kind of similar to a stratified sample, at least the beginning, because the first thing that happens is the population gets divided up into subgroups or sections or clusters, and you go, well, what's the difference, right? Like, this looks like it's gonna be just be another stratified sample, um, but it's not. The difference is that then some of the clusters get randomly selected and data is collected from every individual in that cluster. So that's a little bit different, um, right? So just for an example of how that might work, suppose a researcher wants to estimate the average seniority of Tucson mail carriers, and the way that they get the clusters is by zip code. So since that's pretty balanced, it's usually around, I think, 15 carriers per zip code. Um, and then um, if what they're gonna do is they're just gonna select several zip codes and then check the seniority of every carrier um, in each of those selected zip codes, right? So that's how it would work. Um, so th the beginning where you break it up into subgroups or break it up into clusters, that does sound like a stratified sample, but then what you do after that is different. But just for comparison's sake, let's say if we were going to um, make a stratified random sample out of this instead of a cluster sample. So you could use the same subgroups. So um, you could use, oh, I should have made those uppercase like they're supposed to be. Shame on me. Um, my dad was a, a postal worker for like 30 years. I should know this. Um, so use zip codes as subgroups or strata. Um, and then what we could do is maybe, since we gotta take then a simple random sample from each subgroup, maybe we'll say randomly select five carriers from each zip code, right? Since each one, if it has roughly 15, sample size can't be bigger than that. So we'll just go with five to be safe. But yeah, I mean, there it's, that's turning it into a stratified sample, right? You're taking a random sample out of each subgroup. All right, the, the next one, a systematic sample, um, this is one where um, if you have all of your individuals in your population in a big list, then you randomly select the first one, um, like the first individual that's going into your sample, and then you just kind of cyclically go through and like every 10th or every 20th or every 50th or something like that, um, like, you know, you jump 20, then that person on the list is in the sample as well. You jump another 20, then that person is. So this is one that's actually really easy to catch when it's going on, because really in the homework, that's what you have to do. You have to tell them apart. This is probably the easiest one because it doesn't look anything like the rest of them. And it's a big red flag. So it'll say like every 20th or every 150th or something like that, right? Um, so that's what's going on here, right? Every 20th pair of headphones is supposed to be checked for defects. So the first one, so if you're gonna check every 20th, I guess then within the first 20, you would select one randomly. And so let's say that the 12th is the one selected and then you just go every 20. So 12 plus 20 is 32, plus 20 is 54, plus 20 is 72. And you would do it like that. Um, those are the good sampling methods. Then we have the bad ones. That's what the red is for. Um, a convenience sample is one that's really easy to get. However, it may not be one that represents the population very well. Usually it doesn't. Um, surveys usually end up being convenient samples because they're usually conducted using a single medium, right? If it's an online survey, right, it's just you know, an online poll and that's it, right? It's one medium and that's it. Over the phone, right? Um, if it's a survey done over the phone and that's the only medium being used, right? That, that does end up being a convenient sample. Um, and then for an example of something um, that's kind of over the top, but you can see why it would be bad. If you're gonna estimate the average amount of money people spend on their primary vehicle, but in order to get your sample, um, you're gonna to talk to people in the lobby of a five-star hotel, 
You know, and you think expensive hotel, those people are gonna have money, probably have more expensive vehicles too, right? Um, so then what you're gonna get as um, like a sample mean here is gonna be kind of distorted. It's gonna be too high, right? Compared to the population at large. So the reason convenience samples happen is because they're easy and they're fast, right? It doesn't um, take a lot of elbow grease to collect the sample data, right? It's pretty quick, right? You can just go to one place and do it or just use one medium and do it. Um, and sometimes it has to be fast, right? I mean, um, like for polls and things, like those are supposed to be things where it's like, you know, you got your finger on the pulse, like this is what's happening right now. So there isn't a lot of extra time to, you know, have some like overly elaborate sampling method because like that turnaround has got to be pretty fast. Um, but then for some things, it doesn't really have to be that fast. It just gets done that way because then the data collector doesn't have to do as much realistically. Um, and then a voluntary response sample. Um, this is one where basically your sample picks itself. Um, so sometimes that's called a self-selected sample. I think that's what the Newton notes call it or a volunteer sample, which I mean, I guess volunteer, voluntary response. It sounds like those are the same thing and they are. Um, but usually, I mean, things like um, online polls tend to be that because um, in order to end up in the sample, basically you have to do the work to get in it yourself if you're gonna um, be part of that poll. Um, and the way that they tend to work is that individuals with strong opinions or with special interests, um, just meaning it would be, be better for them to get a certain outcome, I suppose, um, they're gonna be more inclined to participate. Um, the big thing is the strong opinions, right? Because think about like, if you were gonna collect data on like restaurants or something, and you were gonna use Yelp reviews, right? Who's the most motivated to write the Yelp review? Is it the person who goes in and is just like, well, oh, you know, it was fine. Right? They're probably not writing the Yelp review. It's going to be the person that had a bad time. Right? They've got the motivation to do it. Right? They're mad. That's a, being mad is a great motivator. So, right? I mean, that, that tends to be what you get is with um, voluntary samples, you tend to get kind of more extreme opinions in there. Um, um, this one, um, I, I try to think of something that always looks like it's worse than it should be. And it seems like any internet service provider, right? When you look theirs up, um, they always look sort of low. And it's like, that's just because the people who tend to write those Google reviews are gonna be people who are motivated because they're mad, right? Um, you know, maybe their service cuts out a lot and they get annoyed, which I mean, that seems reasonable, but um, that's not gonna happen for everybody. Right. And for the people where, you know, they pay for their Internet service and everything just goes the way it's supposed to. They're probably not going to write a Google review. Right. They're just going to be like, eh, all right, this this works fine. On to the next thing. Right. But the person who has to kind of labor over it, you know, they're going to say, you know, maybe I should say something here. Right. And that's how you end up with the, the kind of, um, I guess, reviews that are sort of slanted toward the negative end of the spectrum. Um, in a voluntary response sample, you can view it as being a type of convenience sample. Um, I think that makes sense. These aren't really separate concepts. It's almost like this one is within this one, but it was a big enough thing where it was worth writing it out by itself. All right, then we got some examples of identify this. So identify these as being a random systematic stratified or cluster sample. So in the first one, large school district, all teachers from two buildings are interviewed to determine whether they believe the students have less homework to do now than in previous years. So here's the key, all teachers from two buildings. So what it looks like here, you're taking all of one selected group and all the second selected group, right? Um, all the teachers from first building, all the teachers from second building. So that looks like clusters and it doesn't really look like anything else. It's certainly not systematic, right? It's not, you know, every 15th teacher or something. Um, it's not stratified because then it would be 
a sample of teachers from each of those buildings rather than all of them, so we can rule that out. Um, it's definitely not random, right? It's not a simple random sample. So yeah, this one would have to be a cluster. So, so cluster sample. Um, B, every seventh customer entering a shopping mall asked to select his or her favorite store. Every seventh, right? It jumps right out when it's the systematic, right? Um, so that is what's going on here. So systematic. Sample. The nursing supervisor selected using random numbers to estimate the average annual salary. Okay, well, there's some kind of randomness in all four of them, but then you look at this and you go, well, there's nothing else built into it. There aren't any subgroups, right? There's no, you know, every seventh or 20th or anything like that. So this one is just random or to use the better term, I suppose. I should say simple, not sample. I need the word sample later in this phrase though, but I wanted simple. Random sample. All right, then every hundredth hamburger manufacturer is checked to determine its fat content. So I guess, you know, like the, maybe like the frozen hamburgers. That's what, th that's what I was thinking about here. Right, because saying hamburgers are manufactured sounds weird, but I didn't really know what other word you could really use for it. Um, but the key, every hundredth, right? Jumps right out again. This is a systematic sample. Okay. Next, I think the next example is the same thing, but a little more elaborate. Yeah. All right. So Modern Managed Hospitals, a national for-profit chain, and management wants to survey patients discharged this past year to obtain patient satisfaction profiles. And then we have to identify these sampling methods or sampling techniques as being simple random sample, stratified systematic cluster, or a convenient sample. Right now we're throwing that into the mix. All right, so first we're gonna obtain the list of patients discharged from all MMH facilities, right? So there's our population. And in this one, we're gonna divide the patients according to the length of hospital stay and draw a simple random sample from each group. Okay, so first we got subgroups, right? The the three days or less, three to seven, eight to 14, more than 14. Um, so, okay, there um, it looks like it's either gotta be stratified or cluster, but if we're taking a simple random sample from each of those groups, that's stratified, right? Cluster, you'd select the groups randomly and then take the whole group, right? So this is stratified sample. All right, then B, you just take the list, number them all, then use a random number generator. Well, no subgroups or anything like that. All right, this is a nice simple setup. So it's the simple random sample. And I guess another way to look at it is when you have a simple random sample, when it's written out, like when the, the sampling method is written all the way out, it looks relatively unadorned, right? Hence simple random sample, I suppose. Um, but yeah, it's just you number them, random number generator, and that's it, right? No subgroups and no anything else. So yeah, simple random sample there. Um, let's see. Here, um, we're going to basically have everyone, all the uh, discharged patients, broken up into subgroups based on what facility they were at and we're gonna randomly select some of the facilities and then include all patients from the selected facilities, that's cluster, right? Because then that way the clusters are the different facilities. So this one is a cluster sample. Then D, at the beginning of the year, instruct each MMH facility to survey every 500th patient discharged every 500th, right? That's the key right there. So this one is systematic. And I know for a systematic sample, it's supposed to be that the first one is random, but 
you know, realistically, the first person discharged on January 1st, right? I mean, um, it's, that's just going to be whoever it is. That's close enough to, you know, actual randomization to be, to be good enough. Especially if you, if you want to think like, well, a random number generator uses an algorithm, so you could argue that that's not pure randomness either. If you want to take it to that extreme, that's not wrong. Um, then the last one, instruct each MMH facility to survey the next 50 discharged patients and send in the results. So just using the next 50, like there's no randomization in here at all. Um, just, you know, get the data as fast as you can, right? Like that's what this is. Um, and when it's do it as fast as you can, that's the convenience sample. All right, so for this one, we had one of each. Since the last one didn't, I figured it'd be nice to have one that did. Okay, now that we've got the sampling methods, what can go wrong? Well, sampling bias is a bad thing, um, and that happens if the sample represents the population poorly, which is what you get with the bad sampling methods, right? And then, like, this is the point of having a good sampling method. Um, if you have a good sampling method, you avoid this. Um, because when you have a biased sample, that means that your statistic probably won't match up very well to the parameter that you're trying to estimate in the population. So you end up with conclusions that aren't correct, which is bad, right? You want to get the things correct. So, all right. Um, what would bias actually entail? Um, it would entail where some members of the population are, um, to, to be general, less likely to be included than others. Realistically, what that means is that you'd have some members of the population that couldn't end up in the sample. And that's the term under coverage. That's what that is. Um, the Newton notes don't use that, but it looked way too weird to me not to talk about this because that's really what you get. Like in real life, this is actually the problem. Um, and the classic example here is that in the 1936 presidential election, um, which was FDR's second term, or I guess the election that led to his second term, um, there's this Reader's Digest poll, and it predicted a comfortable win for Alfred Landon, who was the other presidential candidate. But then what happened in reality was the complete opposite. I'm, I mean, like 60% of the popular vote's pretty high, right, um, for a presidential election. And 46 states out of 48 in the Electoral College, right, only 48 because Hawaii and Alaska weren't states until 1959, um, so what happened, right? I mean, like they predicted a comfortable win in one direction. So like this wasn't even one that was close, right? Like, like they predicted, oh, Alfred Landon's going to like win by, I don't know if they would have said landslide, but at least comfortably. Um, but then what happened in real life was not close and in the complete opposite direction. So something went wrong with this poll, right? Um, so the way that they set it up, was that they contacted individuals from telephone and motor vehicle registration lists. What's wrong with that? The thing that's wrong with that is that this was in 1936. So how many people actually had these things, right? So in 1936, it was about 40% of households had a telephone, about 45% had a motor vehicle. And these aren't distinct from each other. Right? You'd think the overlap here is probably close to, you know, <laughs> complete, um, right? Like people who could afford a motor vehicle probably more likely to also be able to afford a telephone, right? These were expensive items in the 30s. Um, even though this was the point, like starting in the 30s, where you started to get cars that um, were really more for working people, because um, before that, that kind of didn't exist as much but um but anyway like these were still things where um like a lot of people just couldn't afford them so what you end up with is that then the your sampling frame um which is the part of the population the sample actually comes from it's going to skew toward people who are wealthier right because it's people who can afford cars and phones and you know the luxuries of the day um that i guess now we sort of take for granted um but then the sample is also going to skew in that direction. It's going to generally be wealthier, more affluent than the general population. And 
that's going to throw things off, right? And um, that's a big reason why they ended up with a result that was so weird um, out of their poll where it didn't match up with reality at all. Um, it's because their sample didn't really match the population very well. And it doesn't take like a whole bunch of different variables not matching up between the sample and the population. It really only takes one or two and you get things that are crazy, right? Like this, I mean, it's like, okay, well, this is all just kind of based on income for the most part. And that's enough to make the sample throw up this crazy number, right? Like that's, it doesn't take much. And this is why the, um, the bad sampling methods are bad, right? Like this is the sort of thing that happens. Um, let's see, then more examples of biased results and under coverage because the homework really focuses on this point. So this first one is basically the same problem. What if you're gonna estimate the average amount people pay for a new car by collecting a random sample of sales at a Lexus dealership? And you go, well, that's a more expensive car, right? So it seems like their, um, that average amount is gonna be too high, right? Like what you're gonna get out of your sample, that number is gonna be too big compared to the population at large. Um, right, because not everybody can afford to go to the Lexus dealership. Um, so, right, I mean, that's, that's going to throw things off. Um, let's see, here's a convenience sample, right, estimating the average rainfall in Sierra Vista by recording daily amounts during July. And the issue with that, of course, is monsoon season. I suppose maybe not this year as much as in the past, but, um, right, like in, in a regular monsoon season, if you just use daily amounts during July and then projected that to the whole year, um, you would end up with something that looked ridiculous. It would look like Sierra Vista had the climate of like Ketchikan, Alaska. And I think that's the, um, it's one of those panhandle cities. I think that's the one where they have like the rain meter in the middle of town and it, and it hits, you know, 300 inches sometimes during the year, right? Like if you took what happens in July and extrapolated that to the whole year, obviously you're gonna get an amount of rainfall that's really, really incorrect, right? That's the thing that I'm trying to get across there. But with a convenient sample, somebody could do that, right? Or um, estimating the average commute time for workers in Arizona, so for the whole state, um, by obtaining a stratified sample of workers in Phoenix. So the stratified sample part of this is a red herring. Right, because you look at this and you go, oh, stratified sample, that's a good way to do it. Yeah, but if it's supposed to be all of Arizona, you gotta do all of Arizona, you can't just do Phoenix, right? Because um, right, the, the commute time in Phoenix is not gonna be the same as it is for everybody else, right? If somebody lives and works in Sierra Vista, their um, commute time is probably gonna be shorter, right? There's less other traffic to deal with, Right? But then um, you can also say, well, what about, um, you know, like what if there are people who commute from um, Douglas to San Simone, right? That's not a short drive, but nobody in Phoenix is doing it. But, you know, that, that's a thing that's not being included there. And I, I know at least two people who do that. So that's definitely a thing, right? But if you take your sample just from Phoenix, you're not going to include them. Um, so, yeah, like even though it says stratified sample, you want it to have it relate to the entire state if your conclusion's supposed to be about the entire state, not just Phoenix. All right, types of errors. Um, so you can have sampling errors and non-sampling errors. Um, the random sampling error is something that basically you can't get rid of. Um, it's just that when you take a sample, even if you do everything perfectly, your sample is not gonna be an exact microcosm of the population. So there are gonna be some differences between um, your sample measure and the analogous population measure. Or if you took multiple samples, like the number you're gonna get would not be the same for the different samples because different individuals are gonna be included. So there's gonna be some fluctuation there. That's okay, right? Like this statistics is the study of uncertainty, right? So even when you do everything right, there's still gonna be some uncertainty there. That's fine. These other ones, mm, th this is not necessarily fine, right? Then the, the non-sampling errors, because those are due to human errors, like putting in data wrong, 
um, designing the survey in a way that like pushes people towards certain answers, which is usually what poor question wording does. Um, maybe having the survey set up so people will get kind of uncomfortable about certain questions and they don't give the right answer because you know they, they, they get kind of freaked out. Um, Non-response, um, which is a big deal, and that's actually a, a big challenge now to try to reduce that. Um, and then non-random sampling errors. These are really bad because these are easy to work around um, in theory, right? I mean, like it would take more work to collect the, uh, the sample data, but knowing when you're doing something wrong would be pretty straightforward, right? Like if you're using a bad sampling method, you're probably not oblivious to that. It's probably like, no, I just need to get this done really fast. And that's kind of the motivator. Um, but like that can be fixed, right? Like you use a, a stratified sample instead of a convenience sample or something like that. Um, but the random sampling error, cause like there's always the thought of like, well, errors are always bad. Um, I would say the random sampling error just sort of comes with the territory. I don't think of it as being a bad thing or a good thing. It's just there. Um, and it's going to decrease with a larger sample size, but it's still going to be there. Um, and that's okay. Right. Um, you're never going to get everything absolutely perfect, right? You can't make, um, a sample of a thousand people be exactly like the entire U S population in every single demographic variable. That's impossible. So it's okay. Right. It's okay to have random sampling error. Um, and misleading data. Okay. Here's a laundry list. Um, biased sampling methods. I already, already talked about them, which is why it's not really explained there. So that's the convenience sample, voluntary response sample, that kind of stuff. Um, samples that are too small, um, you really don't need an enormous sample. Um, Cause like even that one about the uh, not spending enough time with the kids where the sample size was 369, that's probably gonna be all right for that. Um, but if it's really tiny, that's a problem. Like if you have a sample of size 12, you're like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this, right? So um, too small means like really small. Um, in less than 20, it's pretty hard to say anything. Um, not that that's like a hard cutoff where then 20 and up is fine and under 20 is terrible, but um, just to have like a number where you really get stuck, I would say under 20. Um, because then you couldn't even really use the normal distribution to do any inference. So that's why I picked that. Um, outliers, um, if you have a sample size, it's not very big. And I mean, you can't really get outliers with categorical data, but you can with numbers, right? And let's just say, because a classic thing that tends to have outliers is real estate. Right, because what you tend to end up with is like, and, and you know, if you look on Zillow at basically any city, you'll probably see this, where there will be a few houses that are insanely expensive. And if your sample isn't very big and a couple of them get in there, then if you were trying to estimate the average selling price of a house or the average for sale price of a house, it's probably gonna be way too high, right? Because let's say, you know, you've got a whole bunch of houses that are, you know, 100,000, 150,000, 200,000, like all in that range. And then you've got like a 4 million in there. That's going to make the average go crazy, right? Like, let's say if you only had like 25 or 30 houses in your sample, you get, you know, all these one, $100,000, $200,000 houses. Then you got like a 4 million and a 3.5 million. Your sample mean is going to come out a little high because those two numbers are so much bigger than the rest of them. So outliers can make a mess. Um, if you have a bigger sample size, then the outliers don't have as much of an effect because it's almost like they get overwhelmed because there are so many other data points. Um, they'll have a little effect, but then, then they wouldn't like really throw everything out of whack, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, Self-reported data, generally not reliable. That's what these two examples are supposed to indicate. That first one is obviously wrong. 93% of the samples said they were better than average drivers. That doesn't even make any sense, right? That's not possible. Um, and then uh, this thing about the, uh, the sleep. Um, so self-reported data in sleep studies, it tends to be way higher than reality. 
because um, this is actually a lot when you think about it. Um, overestimating their amount of sleep by an average of 48 minutes. Like, that's kind of a lot. Um, so that's the point here is self-reported data not to be trusted generally. Um, question wording, context. Um, there was this old Ann Landers poll, and this is another one of these classic examples like the uh, 1936 election. Um, but it said, if you had to do it over again, would you have children? And the request for that um, came along with a letter from a young couple listed, um, listing a bunch of anxieties and worries about parenting. And then the percentage who said they would have children if they had to do it all over again, or like would they have children again, um, 30%. And you think, that number is way too low. It is. Um, but then you say, well, there's this leading material and this is a voluntary response sample. So this whole survey is just a giant mess. Um, I guess by comparison, there was a Newsweek survey that was this exact same question that happened later, um, like not much later, like a couple of months later. Um, and it didn't have like all these worries and things. Um, and it wasn't a, a volunteer sample. It was like, like a simple random sample of parents. That one was 91%. You go, okay, that sounds like it makes sense, right? 30% seems ridiculous, 91% seems reasonable. Um, calculation errors, um, just like numbers that clearly don't work, like a decrease of 200% is a thing that you can't have, right? You can't lose more than everything, so you can lose more than 100%. Um, improperly displayed data, I needed a picture to get the right effect here. So. Look at the x-axis, like look right here, where I just circled that 30. That's not what you wanna do, right? You want that axis to start at zero like it does right there, right? So this is good and this is bad. And why is it bad? Because it makes the differences in the heights of these bars really pronounced. And ultimately there's not really that much of a difference, right? Like if you look at these, it's like, okay, like 34 miles per gallon versus 36, like, okay, that's a little difference. It's not something extreme, right? Um, but it looks extreme here. And over here, it doesn't. It looks like the way that you think about it. You go, eh, 34, 36, those are basically in the same range. Um, and so that's an improper display. And a, a common one is to have a bar graph where it doesn't start at zero. Um, and you get things that look like they're big differences that really aren't. Um, Non-response, which this isn't there in the Newton notes, but I had to mention this. This is the biggest problem with surveys currently. Um, like this is the biggest non-sampling error by far um, because nobody really knows what to do about this now. Um, like historically, a lot of surveys and things were done over the phone. And now, like, you know, most people are going to have caller ID and they're going to look at the number and be like, I don't know who that is. And they're not going to answer it. Right. That's what most people do. So what you end up with now is that the response rate is really low. So like for a phone poll now, the expected response percentage is about eight. Um, which means the expected non-response percentage is about 92%, which is really high, right? You think out of every 12 people that you call, if you're trying to do a survey, 11 of them are not going to answer, right? That's kind of a lot. Um, so then that like, this is a big thing now, like how do you deal with this? You know, I mean, I guess one thing is, um, you know, if you need to get a thousand people in your sample, then really you're probably aiming to try to call like 12 to 15,000 people. But then also do you factor in, well, if you have a, this random sample and you miss um, with um, you know, one particular person who lives in, um, I don't know, like, like a specific type of, of area, like, okay, we're, we're missing somebody from this um, subdivision over here, should we try to replace them with somebody else from the same subdivision um, to try to you know balance everything back out? Like it gets really complicated really fast. But the important thing that I wanted to point out is that, right? So non-response, and I guess consequently that, because non-response is a big big deal. Okay, then these last few examples here. How could the data be misleading? 
um, that would result from these data collection methods. So a uniformed law officer interviews a group of 100 college freshmen, and she asks each one if he or she has used any illegal drugs in the past month. Okay, generally, people are not the most truthful when it's drug questions, especially with a uniformed officer, right? Right, that was common sense. So you're probably not going to get things that are awfully accurate out of this survey. Um, so what would happen? Well, respondents might answer untruthfully, right? They might say no when it's really a yes. So we can put that down, right? So respondents... may not answer truthfully, right? Which is almost a common sense answer more than anything else. Um, but then you could also have some people who refuse to participate entirely. Like rather than saying no and it should be a yes, they might just walk away. So some may refuse To participate right like that's that's what you're gonna run into there you're gonna get some non response right with people refusing to participate and you're gonna get some wrong answers all right number 12 let's see a survey about food in a student cafeteria is conducted by having forms available for customers to pick up at the cash register and there's a drop box outside the cafeteria okay so it's a voluntary response sample that's a problem. Um, so we can say that this is a voluntary response sample. And customers say motivated enough to volunteer well, that sounds good so motivated enough to volunteer are more likely to have a negative opinion right displeasure is an excellent motivator right and that's that tends to be with a voluntary response sample what you get um all right then 13 extensive studies of coronary problems were conducted using men over 50 as the subjects what's the problem men over 50 because you think well if you had like a random sample of men over 50 with coronary problems then it seems like you could generalize to the population of men over 50. But does this generalize to women? Does this generalize to younger men, right? I don't know, right? And um, there's not really a way to figure that out based on that data. So I guess that's what we can say is conclusions for men over 50 may not generalize to other groups. And I guess then other groups being women or being younger people, right? Um, we don't know. If it's just men over 50, it doesn't tell us anything about, you know, people who aren't men and people who aren't over 50. So, right? Um, we're kind of in the dark with everybody else. So that's the problem there. I mean, if the point is to have the study just be about men over 50, then this is probably fine. But if it's to generalize to the whole population, then that's not fine. All right, I think that would cover 3A. So I know this one was kind of long. I don't think the other ones are going to be quite this long, but there were so many terms in this one. Um, it was sort of an unavoidable thing to have it be this long.